So that is more or less what I wanted to chat with you guys about today. Do we got questions? So this is obviously the mixing now. How critical is the mastering component of it? And I mean, I have a rough idea of what happens in the interface, but what exactly do you do when they're mastering? Okay. The question is about mastering. We've been talking about mixing. Um, the mastering process is, is basically, it's two things. One, it's taking that mixed stereo audio file that you've spit out of your software after you've done your work as a mixer, and it's putting the final polish, the final tweaks. It's, it's, it's saying, okay, now typically mastering engineers have immaculate acoustic environments, so they can hear things that you would have missed oftentimes uh, if you're paying for a good engineer, right? Um, so they're going to be able to say, okay, well, the low end in this particular mix it, I see where the guy's going, but it's, it's going to be unruly on this kind of system or that kind of system, so I'm going to accentuate it or decrease it or whatever, adjust it in whatever fashion. Um, it's, a lot of it is frequency-based and compression, just to get the levels and spikes and stuff in order. So that's the one thing that a mastering engineer will do, is just put the icing on the cake, right? And then the other thing is that they will also assemble a CD. So if you've got 10 tracks that is designed to be an album, then the mastering engineer is also going to be responsible for making sure that every track sounds like it belongs on the same record, that there's volume consistency, so you don't skip the track two and it's way louder than track one, these kinds of things. So in a nutshell, those are the two jobs of the mastering engineer. And it's an important stage. I, I, it makes a big difference. I recommend that if you've never done it, take your best mix, and spend a few bucks and get a professional to master it and hear the difference as to how it comes back. Because it does make a big difference, especially assuming you hire someone who's skilled. Yeah. <laughs> right? To reiterate, what they're doing is further doing EQ and compression on stuff that we didn't hear in our mixer. That's right, yeah. Or yeah. Two bus because it's not like a multi channel. Not multi track. The mastering engineer gets the stereo mix, and that's it. Left and right channels, that's it. Um, so, although sometimes mastering engineers will get stems. So you'll have all the drums, stereo, all the guitars, all the vocals, and then they have a little bit more control. So you, you, some mastering engineers hate that, though, because it means they have to make more decisions that you should have made as the mix engineer. Right? So you, if you're going to get something mastered, have a conversation, find out what they prefer. Um, but typically, it's just one stereo audio track. Anything else? I think it's great. And if you bought a Mac, it's already there. Like it's, it's, they put it, they include it in the operating system, talking about GarageBand. And it's quite powerful. I mean, considering it's free with your, with your computer. Um, they probably roll it into the price, I'm sure. But <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's all the things we started the conversation with. It's that whole acquisition chain, right? The guitar sound got to sound great to begin with, and then if the microphone's not doing it justice, then now you know what to buy next. If you've got a great microphone, but it's still something is wrecking the sound, then you go deeper and deeper along that acquisition chain until you find out what's inhibiting the quality of what you hear with your ear when you listen to the amp. If you don't hear a good sound, then forget about it. You're not going to record a good sound. So you got to start there, right? But then, yeah, just like I say, it's just finding out along that acquisition chain, which really is only three things, microphone, preamp, and converters, essentially. Um, and then after, again, it doesn't matter if it's an iPad, GarageBand, or your phone, or whatever. Once you're digital, you can't lose any quality anymore. Once you're past the converters. So it's something before that <laughs> that's getting in your way, right? Um, Mac or PC for Pro Tools? Qu question is Mac or PC for Pro Tools? Um, I would say Mac for checking your email. Mac for anything. The Mac is a better operating system. Not, I don't necessarily mean the Apple computers. They make nice computers. I've got one right there. They're sleek and everything. That's just a side benefit. It's the operating system that I'm talking about. It's far more stable and reliable than Windows is. Um, and I used to sing a very different tune. <laughs> I, I've been a tech nerd all my life, 
and I used to never understand why people spent the money on Macs when I could buy three PCs at that price. It just made no sense to me. And then one, one day I built what we call a Hackintosh, just for fun. I hacked the Mac operating system onto my Dell laptop just to see if I could do it, work great. And I used it for a couple of weeks, and it's like the clouds parted, and I understood. <laughs> it's better. That's why it costs more. And it's better in the way that it's more stable. It's more reliable. Nowadays, when I go down to my studio, my machine is on 24-7. So I, I wiggle the mouse, the screens turn on, I hit play, and I continue. That was not my experience as a Windows user. Oh, crashes, freezing, things like if I pull, pull the USB cable out and put it back in, I, it doesn't automatically pick back up. I've got to close Cubase and turn it back on again in order to, for it to register. It's a whole pile of little things that you suffer from as, as a Windows user that you don't as a Mac user. So I do, yeah, uh, at the risk of sounding like a fanboy, <laughs> I do definitely recommend Apple computers for sure. You had something? Yeah, well, a question about mixing bass guitar. Mm -hmm. I've heard that you've got to pay attention to the key that the bass is playing in. It has certain frequency anomalies that need to be carved out. I'm yeah. I've heard of that, and, and if so, you know where I'm going to chart that lists. Well, I think more importantly, if I'm thinking about paying attention to the key that the bass is in, I'm, I'm typically not considering the mix per se, but I'm considering what that's going to do to my acoustic environment. Because those bass frequencies have such a high energy behind them, if the, if, if the bass player is playing in a certain key that certain notes, the fundamental notes of that key, excite my room in a different way, then I'm going to be hearing what's not actually recorded. You know, and I'm going to be making inappropriate decisions. It's what, they, it's what you know, they refer to it as room modes or standing waves between the two surfaces of, of two parallel surfaces in your room. Whatever that mathematical distance is, the measurement between those spaces, certain frequencies are going to exactly match that distance. And the base frequencies we're talking about. High frequencies are real short, but there's going to be base frequencies that are exactly that distance in your room. And those ones that are exactly the same distance as the parallel surfaces will tend to build upon themselves and create an exaggeration in the sound that doesn't actually exist. So you're going to be hearing louder notes, and you're going to be adjusting things to compensate, and then you're going to play it somewhere else, and it's going to fall apart. Right? So that's the only thing I can think of when considering the, the key that the bass is in, is how that's going to excite my room differently. If you've got a beautifully tuned room, these things are less of a concern, but most of us don't. So. That's something to think about. Um, when I record my guitar, um, he usually lays down like a drum track first, and I record over it. I'm recording in time, but then when we play it back, my guitar is like right after the drums. Every time. Yeah, that's going to be a system setting. <clears throat> Are you a Windows user? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Probably got something to do with that. <laughs> That I've experienced that before, but not for years. When I'd record, so talking about recording something, playing perfectly in time with the drummer, but on playback, the guitar is latent. It's out of sync with the music. Um, I've experienced that before, but not for years, and not since I've switched to a Mac. So I don't know exactly what the cause is. That, that, that those two things might not correlate necessarily, but it, that shouldn't happen because your software will automatically compensate for de delays of processing and system time and all that stuff. Um, unless you're an old Pro Tools user, like Pro Tools LE8 or whatever, didn't have automa automatic delay compensation, which I boggled my mind. I had delay compensation since the 90s as a Cubase user, but that's a whole other topic of conversation. <clears throat> but yeah, it shouldn't happen. So something is not right in the computer. Anyone else got any? Uh... You mentioned 24 bit earlier. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you want to convert. Yeah, you want to convert at the highest bit depth possible. The uh, the sample rate is not as important. And again, the real audiophile purists will argue me on that one. But the sample rate is not this. I challenge. Put it this way. I challenge anyone to consistently and accurately spot the difference in a blind listening test between 44.1 and 96k which are different sample rates, right? It's just not that obvious. But what it does do is give you a much bigger file size and make it much harder for your computer to churn all the data. However, the bit depth is something you can actually hear. And, and, and just to clarify for those of you who don't know, the sample rate is how many snapshots of audio per second are being recorded, are being captured. 
So standard CD quality is 44.1 kilohertz, meaning 44,100 samples per second are being recorded. So 96,000 kilohertz, or hertz, yeah, 96 K, 96 kilohertz, is much more samples per second. So you would stand to reason that it's a higher quality signal, which it is, but it's not that noticeable. However, your bit rate, your, or excuse me, your bit depth is each one of those samples, those 44,100 of them, each one of them is represented by how many numbers, how many binary ones and zeros. So 16 bit means there's 16 numbers that represent each sample. So the waveform goes up, down, and back to zero. That's one, that's one cycle. How many numbers are representing that? And so 16 bit, there's 16 numbers. 24 bit, there's 24 numbers representing that same piece of audio. That is something you can hear. And the difference is, is it's exponential, by the way. From 16 bits to 17 bits is an exponential increase in quality. From 17 to 18, exponential again. So from 16 to 24 is massive, okay? And what will happen is, in 16 bit or lower, because there's less bits representing the audio, it affects things like dynamic range, for example. So if you were to listen on really good headphones or a really quiet room and listen to, like, say, a snare shot with some reverb on it, and the reverb will decay and the tail will slowly fade to silence. With a 24-bit file, you're going to hear that reverb tail decay. With a 16-bit file, you're going to hear that reverb tail decay and then it will truncate and chop itself off because there's no more bits left to represent the rest of the data on the way down to silence, okay? So that's definitely something. My recommendation is don't worry about the sample rate. 44.1 is fine. That's what a CD is going to play back at anyway. But do worry about your bit depth. Capture at the highest bit depth possible, which by, with, from a hardware perspective is 24-bit. Your converters can capture at 24-bit. Once you're past the converters and you're into your software, a lot of software will allow you to manipulate that audio at 32-bit or 64-bit but the actual converters are 24, and you want to always be recording at that. So if you have a converter back to 6202 for 35 bucks, it's going to make it sound better than the USB I'm taking out of my mixer today? Yeah, it's just line in and converting to digital. If it converts that 24-bit, most likely, yeah. For $30, I would say try it. <laughs> we got a return policy. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Quite possibly so. It's 16 bit, yeah. And it, again, it depends on how critical your ear is and, and, and in your listening environment. If, you, if it's noisy and there's fans, you're not going to hear any difference. But if you're listening with a nice uh, uh, a listening scenario, uh, yes, you'll hear the difference for sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you had something over here? Or? Oh, no, I just said you got to convert it back to 16. Yes, yes, yes. You do dither it down to 16 once you're done working. That's right. If you're going to burn a disc, that is. Um, that's right. Yeah. Anyone got anything else? Um, Thunderbolt, Firewire, all these different ones that we just did, that really make a difference at the end of the day? Or? So this question is about the difference between Firewire, USB, Thunderbolt, how do we get the audio in? It doesn't make a difference in terms of quality, no. Uh, be, because again, once you're past the converters, all you're doing is sending ones and zeros across that cable. That's it. So there's no difference quali quality-wise. Um, there is a difference potentially on... Um, the consistency of the stream of data. Like, for example, one of the reasons why a lot of people preferred FireWire over USB is because FireWire is a direct, uninterrupted, full duplex stream of data, both directions, right? Whereas USB is more packet-based, kind of like a Wi-Fi network. It's packet, 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 which is no problem. If you plug a hard drive in and you move a big file from one hard drive to another over USB, if it drops a packet, it doesn't matter because it checks uh, it checks at the end and says, oh, we missed that one, and it resends it, no problem. But when you're doing something that's real time, like capturing audio or video into the computer, then that dropout, that it sounds like a dropout in your audio or a drop frame in your video. So now that said, it very rarely happens, but the potential is there. So for that reason, a lot of people would consider FireWire the superior option. Um, th you get a lot of people that say, okay, well, FireWire 800 is faster than USB 2. Like it's 800 megabits per second instead of 480 megabits per second, which is true, but as far as audio is concerned, it makes no difference whatsoever. The amount of channels that you can simultaneously record on 480 uh, megabit USB 2 is way more than your hardware would ever, ever, ever allow. Like it, it, even if you had a console that could capture 250 channels at once, you still got room in the pipe. 
for more. So that's a non-issue. That's all marketing. Who cares if it's faster? It makes a difference if you're moving big files from hard drive to hard drive. If you want to move 25 gigabytes over here, Thunderbolt's the way to do it, because zoop, and it's there. But for audio, it doesn't make much of a difference at all. The one advantage with Thunderbolt, though, is that you can daisy chain multiple things off of that port. So if you've got a situation like this, a little MacBook Pro, then you can, you can have your mobile solution, but then you go home, you sit it on your table, you plug one Thunderbolt cable in, and now you've got your audio interface, two external hard drives, a 27-inch monitor, and everything all connected with that one cable. That's kind of cool. You definitely are a tech geek, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that means you can do the same with FireWire, though, at the same time, right? Yeah, not as many devices, but yeah. Yeah, that's right. I'm using a PC, but I've got a FireWire with my SAT fire. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And, and Thunderbolt will allow a display as well, which I don't believe you can do over FireWire. Yeah. So it's kind of convenient if you've got that little tiny computer that you take with you and you want to have it at home and have a nice big rig and just one cable in, it's nice. <laughs> All right. Uh huh. Okay. It's a good question. The, Talking about re recording to your built-in hard drive or using an external hard drive to record to, the, the advantage with using an external hard drive is that the way a hard drive works, unless you're using SSD solid state, the mechanical regular hard drives, it's a spinning plate and there's a stylus that reads and writes the data, right? So if you imagine, if you were ambidextrous and had much more control over your limbs than I do, and you could write with both hands, you could write much faster, pure and simple. Right? So if you have two hard drives reading and writing data, the system performance improves. So that's the advantage. So I've got my operating system and my Cubase or Pro Tools or whatever running on this drive, but the, drive, the pen that's doing the writing is on another drive so that this pen can worry about reading and writing the system uh, functions. So that's an advantage there. So what I like to do in my system, I have a desktop machine. It's actually a Hackintosh because I like the Mac OS, but I didn't have five grand for what I wanted. So I put one together and it's got my main system drive, which is a solid state drive just for the speed. It's much, much faster. They're more expensive, but if the budget allows, I recommend it. And then I have a file drive, that's my active file drive. So when I, when I hit record and the computer's recording audio, it's recording to that drive. When I hit play, it's playing back from that drive, right? Then the other thing I have is an, another drive that houses my sample libraries. So if I'm using VST instruments that have big sample libraries like Superior Drummer or Ivory Pianos or whatever, um, so that when I hit a key on my MIDI controller, the sound is being read from this drive, and, and while the guy talking in the mic is being recorded to that drive, while this drive is running the whole show, <laughs> right? So I get a more efficient use of my system. And then I have two other hard drives dedicated 100% to backup, which I highly recommend. Hard drives are cheap now. Buy one or two or three extra and set them up as automated backup because a wise man once told me that there's two types of hard drives, ones that have failed and ones that are going to fail. So, so I mean, proceed with that in mind. Um, that's a whole other aside. But I have two dedicated big, big, fat hard drives in my computer that I don't ever touch. They just automatically back everything up every night or every whatever the system is set to do. So that's how, I, that's how I do it, and that's the reasons why, is multiple styluses, styli, writing and reading at the same time. Barry. I have to make a move. Thank you very much for this occasion. You're welcome, Barry. I hope I will hear from you soon. You will. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> okay, pretty much good? We got, you got one? Okay. What is your suggestion as how to achieve the best sound? I'm not totally sure I follow you. So you've got a sound. So I'm, using, I'm using a sample on a keyboard that I made, but I'm using low frequency oscillation with it. So it sounds good. To manipulate the envelope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I find that when it's um, mixed with like the drums, the claps, the snares, I feel like maybe there's a bit of rumble or maybe it's not as crisp to my ear as I'd like it to be. Without hearing it, it's really hard to give you an answer on that. Um, whenever you have, one thing I will say though, is whenever you have movement, 
with your LFOs are creating envelope shifts, so the, the sound is changing. It's kind of like a chorus or a flanger does that. It's an envelope shift that changes the sound. Um, you have to be real careful because the spectrum from one change to the other, and if multiple things are modulating at the same time, can cause all kinds of audio anomalies that only show up once in a while when it's in that point of the modulation phase, right? So it can sometimes be real difficult to get a really overly modulated signal to sit nicely in any mix. So that much I can tell you for sure, it's difficult at best. What you can do sometimes to help is, is over compression, like dramatic, drastic compression, so that you at least keep the levels of that modulated effect in check, while maybe the panorama and the frequency characteristics are changing, depending on what your LFO is controlling. But other than that, I don't know. I couldn't give you a better answer without hearing it. Right. Yeah. OK, good. <laughs> right. Has anyone else got anything curious about? Pretty much good? All right, OK. So I appreciate your time, by the way. Um, I love doing this kind of stuff. So, um, and for those of you who don't know, I, I run a course at MixLessons.com. So if you're into this stuff and you want to go deep, um, then by all means, check it out. In fact, I've got some thank you cards here that you all can have that get, offers a little discount as a way of saying thanks for hanging out with me. So feel free to check that out. Um, and then, of course, you can reach me too here or through my websites as well if you want, if you got questions. I don't know if, for those who've never been to the Tech Muse Academy, it's a site where I'm doing quick tips and video tutorials on a regular basis. And a lot of the ideas that I get to do the videos about come from the questions that I get from people. So feel free to take advantage of that. Um, in fact, I've got all kinds of things all over the site that says leave me a message, leave me a voicemail, ask me a question, this and that. So by all means, feel free. And, uh, and the ones that I think are, uh, are useful to the masses, I'll just make a video out of it and, and, and put it up that way. Okay? Uh, so once again, appreciate that. And just before we wrap it up, I just want to play you a couple of things here. <clears throat> we were talking a little bit earlier about sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to hear how much, how much of what you're hearing is the mix and how much of it was the recording, and how much of it was the mastering, and so on and so forth. So I just prepared a couple of things that are uh, the before and afters. So you can hear what the track sounded like right off the microphones, and then what they sounded like after a bit of, uh, a bit of mixing, OK? So I'll start off with this guy here. Uh, let's see. Oops, we'll start with this one. So this is a tune by a band called These Three Cities called Kill Moon. Love this song. How's that for volume? All right. So it sounds good. The instruments are clean and clear, right? Sounds pretty good. forward a bit to the chorus. Then if, we, if we listen to this one. Here there's depth, right? There's space now. Chorus come in here for a sec. Don't call me a liar. Call me a liar. I've been waiting for too long to have these guys come from me alone. And I'll stop my 
before the mix, after the mix, right? That's an example there. So you can hear my goal was to make space, was to create, make the singer sound like a star, right? Uh, make, make it so that there was a nice energetic transition from one section to the other. Now the arrangement helped with that because the, the way the parts were written, right? But that was kind of the goal. Was that the spot where you uh, boosted the drums on the I believe I did. I mixed that a long time ago, so I don't really remember, but it sounds like something I'd do. <laughs> um, so let's have a listen to this one. Let's skip in a little bit. Or am I just full of doubt? Cause when you leave a feet like hell, I'm tired of all this kiss full of doubt. Cause when you leave a feet like hell, I'm tired of all this Cause when you leave a feet like hell, back and forth, right? You hear like in the no mix there, the, the, the cymbals on the drums that, during that fill, they just they pop out and they get at your ear. So this is where compression is used to smooth those types of things out, right? Um, and, but you can, you can hear though that the tracks themselves, they sound good. There's nothing wrong with them. But the mix, of course, brings it to life, brings it to the next level. Absolutely, you can automate anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you really can automate. You can automate tuning. If you want to make a, a, an instrument go out of tune and back in, if you can do anything with automation. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so significant differences or one or two small things that you did that made that much of a difference? It was a million minute things. That's the... That's the I want you to make it simple. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's better, like how many hours between no mix versus the sum? Like if you were to... Uh, maybe if I have solid block of time and energy, because that makes a big difference, low energy, poor decisions, <laughs> right? Um, I would say six, seven hours, maybe. Um, a lot of it in the beginning is, is just fixing and, and, and getting rid of the things I don't want. And, uh, well, very minimal editing, or else the price goes up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But editing only something that really offends my ear, you know? If it's like, this just won't work, then I'll go ahead and I'll fix it. But for the most part, it's a lot of, yeah, um, a lot of subtractive equalization in the beginning, which is removing the frequencies that aren't advantageous to that particular element, that don't really reinforce what its role in the mix is, getting rid of them, especially low frequencies. Um, one of the things that revolutionized my mixing is learning, learning the concept that if you've got 27 tracks in your mix, there should be 26 high-pass filters, like rolling off the low end. One element in your mix, maybe the kick drum, maybe the bass guitar, gets the low frequencies. Nothing else is allowed down there because it's too high energy, it's too high headroom, there's too much competition. And as soon as I learned that, roll off, roll off, roll off all the low end, then all of a sudden I had all this space to work with that didn't exist before. So I do a lot of that kind of stuff in the beginning, um, corrective stuff, and once I get past that, next thing I'm, de I'm dealing with is dynamics and EQ. So I'm using the compression to level things out, like those cymbals we were just listening to were all, all over the place. I, I level those and rein them in, right? And then uh, I move into sort of placing things. Now, one thing I like to do is I like to, I like to resist touching a pan pot until as far into the process as I can. Because, well, for a couple of reasons. One, when everything is panned down the center, it's a lot easier to hear issues competition issues, these kinds of things, masking, these types of things. So w when something's over here and something's over here, they might be totally competing with one another, but it's harder to notice because they're spaced out uh, spatially, right? But I keep everything down the middle, make sure every puzzle piece is just fitting together. I can hear the bass, the kick drum is accentuating nicely, the vocal is right up where I want it to be, and then the glorious moment when I spread it all apart, and now I got this beautiful sound stage. I, like, I just enjoy that part of the process. So I keep everything mono for that reason, and then I get to that lovely part where I get to spread everything out, and then from there, I focus on pushing things back and forward with my, with my um, ambient effects. That's my method. Other engineers work differently, but that's the way I found works best for me.
And uh, yeah, I'll play you one more here. Now you'll notice too that last mix was a lot more dense. There was a lot more going on. So it's a little hard, like the first mix was real sparse, lots of room, lots of space for reverb tails and things like that. I love mixing those kind of tracks for that reason. I can, I can really play with the tools. When you have more tracks, if you've got 32, 48 channels in your session, um, then it, you really have to strategize how you're going to make everything fit. And you have to, you, you end up making a lot of very subtle decisions between this element and that element are just a little on top of each other, and you're making a lot of very small decisions to make it so that everything has a place in the session, um, which can be a challenge. I'll play you this one. This is a bit of a sort of heavier number. this one, I mean, it's all guitar, 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 right? And I was just checking to see if we could hear it here, because this isn't the most ideal listening environment. But my, my goal with this one was to try to get the guitars to sound like they're right here. One guy there and one guy there just chug, chug, chugging away without, without losing the vocal, without burying the vocal in the mix. And that's a bit of a challenge. I, I'd have to look at the session to see exactly what I did. But that was my thought process. That's what I was trying to achieve, make those guitars just sound huge without covering up everything else, and that can be a little bit of a trick. So I'm using uh, heavier compression settings to bring up that, that we talked about, that intimacy, right? Um, I'm using drastic pan positions so that there's a hole in the middle still for the vocal to sit in. If I had panned those in a little bit, the vocal is, just gets all crowded and, and kind of disappears in the mix. And then again, trying to make it so that all those parts fit you know, with, with that much information going on at the same time, which was a bit of a challenge too. But lots of fun. <clears throat> Any questions at all? It's a good question. It's a good question because you get to a point where you, if you continue, you're just ruining it, <laughs> right? Like you just keep making another, another decision, another decision, another decision. Before you know it, especially if you don't have a clear strategy, then you're undoing decisions you made earlier by accident and so on and so forth. So it's a hard one to answer with great certainty, but the thing I like to do is make sure you have a plan. Like know what the end result is. I'm trying to make this sound here, I'm trying to make it feel like this, and I want this effect and this emotional impact. And once you f hear that coming out of your speakers, save, print. <laughs> like, to what your plan is, yeah, yeah. And like I say, in the beginning, it's hard to know what that plan is because that's why I brought these tracks in today, so you can hear the before and the after. And Because when you hear a tune on the radio, yeah, it sounds great, I want mine to sound great, but I don't know what the plan was. Like, I don't know how the mixer got from here to here because I don't know where they started from, you know what I mean? And, but yeah, hopefully this helps a little bit, and hopefully as you start to mix more, then you, you just start to... Your, your mind's ear, so to speak, starts to be able to play the sound in your head before you hear it out of the speakers. And then you know, as soon as I hear, what, hear what's going on in here, done. <laughs> Move on to the next, the next task. But yeah, it's, I've done it before. I've killed mixes. Like, I've sucked all the life out of them because I just, oh, I can perfect that. No, oh, I can do this. And I got 8,000 tiny automations going on to just smooth absolutely everything out. And in the end, there's no life left in the tune. So, hard question to answer, but food for thought, I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah. 
reinforce that, what you said, they said, the best thing to do is find a recording that's similar to what you're achieving. So all these songs sound different in their own way. Mm -hmm. so you identify a song that had a great mix on it that you know, and that's similar to that, and A and B it afterward. Go back and listen to that track. Absolutely. In that same environment, yeah. that's similar to that, and get as close to it as possible. Yeah. In fact, import it. Import it right into your session and mute it when you're working on your music, but unmute it and solo it. All these songs, there's songs out there that sound, that have those elements in it. You can down to <clears> the <throat> tracks of it, that you can find a song that's that similar to it. Listen to that in the same, like right after it. Because you're right, otherwise you yeah. just keep going. You'd be like, oh, I can do this. And do yeah. Yeah, the, the human mind works by comparison, right? So you either directly compare to something as a reference, which is great, and sometimes I'm lazy and I don't do it, but it's a great, great practice. So you bring in, like, like you're saying, bring in a reference track and A, B, that way you can compare, uh, because that's the only way it works. And as you gain experience, then you compare what you're hearing to your memories of previous projects. Then you can compare that way, but it's always a comparison, no matter how you, how you stack it, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I, I think it's also a good practice to create yourself a reference disc so that you have, like, you know, if you're doing a rock kick drum, this is the tune that has the rock kick drum that I like. Or if you're thinking about a guitar tone, this is the tune. Because that's the thing with a reference that used to always throw me off is like, okay, well, this song isn't my song, so I don't want it to sound exact. No, I want the kick drum. And then on this tune, I want the room sound. I want the ambience from this tune. So I'll refer to that when I'm doing that, those decisions and so on. So I have a little uh, a disc that I made a long time ago that I haven't used in a long time either um, that has that. It's got tracks that have things that I like about specific elements of the mix. And then I'll use that to refer when I'm focusing on those things. Yeah. Any other questions? Because I'm pretty much done. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much. Did everyone get a card? A little thank you card?